Good morning. morning. Happy Halloween. What? Yeah. uh, yeah, Listen, I got to be honest. I've never uh, preached on a Halloween Halloween day Halloween day before. I've never. uh, I got to tell you, doesn't feel any different than any other day. Uh, So no. Hey, listen. We are so excited that you guys are here. If I haven't met you uh, yet or had the pleasure of meeting you, my name is Weston Weaver. My wife and I get to serve as the executive pastors here. Uh, Student and Connections are our emphasis. And listen, we just want to say thank you for being here. Man, you guys look good. Y'all like, look around. All the single people will say, hey. No, I'm kidding. I'm sorry. Don't, don't do that. Don't do that. Hey, listen, Pastor Chris and Megan are gearing up to go on their hunting trip. Pastor Megan, Pastor Megan's excited um, for her hunt. No, Pastor Chris, I know, is elated. He is ecstatic, gets to go shoot some deer uh, with his kids, and Pastor Megan is going to go hunt, uh, uh, shopping. <laughs> That's what she's going to go do. She's going to go shopping. Um, but listen, they last week we got an opportunity to gift them with that trip. They're gearing up for, uh, for that trip in Weatherford, Texas, going to do that. We're so happy for them and excited for them. Man, they celebrated five years. They've been our pastors for five years years. How awesome is that? That's awesome. That's awesome. Kelsey and I will celebrate five years in January, so. (laughs) Kidding, kidding. Who put that in my notes? All right, we're so blessed. We're so blessed. We miss Pastor Chris, Pastor Megan. We love you guys. I want to give you guys just a heads up, a forewarning. Y'all seen those like movie reviews where it's like spoiler alert, right? All those types of things. Here's your warning now. We have the greatest kids and children's ministry like known to man, like on the planet. It's really good. Pastor Lydia is really good at what she does. That being said, when, when she gets to do that, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, you can clap for that. Yeah. Because she gets to do that, that means I get to say whatever I want in here. I'm kidding. That's not, that's not true. Uh, but while Pastor Chris is away, no, I actually covered this message with him first. And he goes, you sure you want to preach that while I'm gone? Like high voice like that too. You sure? You sure? I was like, dude, I just feel like, I feel like God can really, and he's like, okay, all right. So that being said, this sermon, this message today is PG-13 plus, all right? It's, it's on the cusp. So if you would like to take advantage of your children's ministries now would be the time. Nobody look at anybody awkwardly or weird. We're just letting you know so that way you don't have to explain something later. If you do, it's not my fault, all right? Just parent the moment in Jesus' name. Today, we're going to talk about a strange story. Like, y'all, like, if they made a movie about this, it's be weird. It's strange. And it gets, like, stranger as we read on. Like, it's going to get intense. Kelsey's like, you really said that? Like, why do you want to preach this? And I was like, because I'm the youth pastor. <laughs> um, no, I, I, I didn't evil laugh like that at all. But uh, it's crazy at some of the stories that are in this book. But yet God has a message through the bizarre. And I believe God wants to speak to you today. This, this story is found in Genesis chapter 38. Genesis chapter 38, you can go ahead and find your place there in your Bible or scroll there on your iPad or tablet or phone, or you just cheat and just look on the screen. That's fine too. Um, but this story is found in Genesis chapter 38. It is in the midst. It is sandwiched between the story of Joseph, Joseph the dreamer, Joseph, the kid with the coat of many colors, right? Uh, Jacob, his father, made him this coat of many colors. He's flaunting it around like, hey. He had 11 other brothers. He's like, hey, look at me. I'm the best. Daddy loves me more. And so all the other brothers hated him for this. So they did what any other brothers would do. They sold him into slavery, right? (laughs) See you later. (laughs) Love you, mean it. Not. Um, sells him into slavery, and he ends up uh, inevitably being uh, sold to a man named Potiphar, who is a very powerful man, uh, second in command in all of Egypt at that time. He gets committed of a crime that he did not commit and then gets thrown into prison, and all of a sudden, he gets an opportunity. The dreams come to fruition, and he is placed in second in command over all of Egypt. That is how Israel 
was brought to Egypt. That is how the whole story unfolds if you read throughout Genesis. But then there's this one random little story. One random off the beaten path story in Genesis chapter 38 that gives us a glimpse of Judah's life. Judah being the older brother of Joseph. It gives us a little snapshot. Now typically like when you start reading it, you start reading it and you're like, oh, I'm just gonna go on back to Joseph's story because this is just depressing and this is just nasty and I just, ooh. Okay, again, it's, it's something that's there and you have to understand, you have to ask yourself, why did the author put this in the Bible? It's gotta have some importance, right? If it's sticking out like a sore thumb from Joseph's story, if he placed it in here for a purpose, then it's gotta be in there for a purpose. So we're gonna read this story today in Genesis chapter 38. It's all about Judah. Judah finds a wife, he marries the daughter of Shua. Shua is a Canaanite. Uh, Between Judah and his wife, they have three sons, Ur, Onan, and Shelah. Great names, right? I encourage you guys to take note of that. Ur, Onan, and Shelah. Uh, Verses six through seven, Judah is now trying to find his sons wives, okay? Ur is the oldest. He is the firstborn. Therefore, he has the birthright. Ur, literally how you spell it, how it sounds, E-R, okay? <laughs> emergency room, all right? This brother needed an emergency room, emergency room after what's going to happen. Um, Ur apparently uh, was a, a wicked man, okay? Ur was a bad dude. They find a wife for this guy named Tamar, Tamar is going to be a central character and really a pivotal character for our story today. Ur and Tamar get married, but because Ur was wicked, God struck him dead. Killed him. He's a bad dude. Obviously, he was not following the regulations and the guidelines in which God had placed for him in his life. So he was killed. Now, traditionally and ritualistically, you have to understand that back in the day, in this time period, it was, it was custom for if someone in the family died, that being a son, the main son, the birthright, the firstborn, if he died and passed away, then the next in line would marry his wife in order that they may produce the heir the birthright grandson that would ultimately have all of the inheritance, right? So you follow me? This is custom. This was customary that Onan now, the second born son, would have to marry his brother's wife. That's weird, okay? Happy Halloween. (laughs) So so he, and now Onan is like, (laughs) What did I do to deserve this, right? She's not even good looking, right? You don't even have a cool name, Tamar. Sounds like bizarre. I don't know. I don't know why he had the reasoning that he had, but apparently he just didn't like the woman. But they get married. And the Bible says, don't get mad at me, the Bible says that on honeymoon night when they were to consummate the marriage and produce the next in line, the grandson, the heir, the Bible says that Onan emitted on the ground instead of producing the seed that he was supposed to. God didn't like that because you're not doing what he told you to do. So God struck him dead. So now Ur and Onan are dead and Judah's like, I can't get no sons around here. Shelah, you too young. What am I supposed to do with you? You're like 13. You can't be marrying this girl. And so he's in a frenzy. He's, he's distraught. He's upset. He's like, what is going on? Like, er, he's wicked. Own it. He don't listen. Like, y'all dumb. Like, what do I got to do to try to help y'all understand that God has to fulfill something in our lives? And poor Tamar, she's just sitting there. She's widowed now twice. And she's just, she's heavily scarred. She apparently can't be with someone that wants her in return. She is obviously distraught. Onan was to marry her, (laughs) excuse me, Onan was to marry her, and he could not listen, did not listen. And in verse 10, 
he was killed. Number one, uh, I want you to write this down. We all know it. What's the phrase, the age old saying? Rules are made to be. No, they're not. I'm sorry, I set you up for that. That's my bad. I mean, that's, that's, it's technically my fault, but you should have known better. <laughs> rules are, they're not made to be broken. Rules are made to be obeyed. Ru- rules are made to be followed. And thank you, Teen Challenge, for not saying the right answer, because y'all are here first service. <laughs> R- rules are meant to be, they're made to be, go ahead and throw up the next slide. They're, they're made to be obeyed. The, the whole purpose, the whole, the whole reasoning why rules are in place are to what? Keep us safe, right? It's, it's like those speed limit signs. They're not suggestions. <laughs> Even though I was breaking them last night on the way down here. <laughs> we had a wedding in, in Minden and I, was, I had to get my family home at a decent time. I didn't go to sleep till midnight, y'all. I am jacked up on some coffee right now. Hey. <laughs> And cough medicine, that too. Y'all can hear, yeah. Jesus. But, uh, but I know this, I know this, that, that when I say something in my household, it's, it's meant to be followed, right? Uh, and, and last night, like putting our kids to bed and, and things are just crazy. Like we're trying, you know, I'm yelling at a kid, get you, get over here, right? We have a five-year-old, she's going on 15. Um, she lost her mind. She's she crazy, y'all, she's crazy. Um, <laughs> I don't know who she gets that from. No, I'm kidding. Uh, no. no, she obviously gets it from me. Um, but but I, I do know this. This is what I've noticed about my five-year-old is that we've taught her at this time to, to listen to what we say, right? Listen to what we say. You, you, need to, you need to carry out what we ask you to do when we ask you to do it, right? Could you imagine with me if you told your child to go clean the room? Right? What, what, if, what if I were to tell Camry, hey, baby, hey, I need you to go clean your room. Um, I need you to go fix all that stuff up because you got Barbies everywhere. I have three girls, okay? Three of them. We got Barbies on Barbies on Barbies. They're everywhere, all right? Don't you buy, buy my kid more Barbies, okay? I will throw it in the trash. <laughs> she keeps asking us for a Barbie dream house. I said, no, that's why the grandparents have them, so we can go and play, and they stay, and we come back, okay? That's why. But what if I were to ask my daughter, what if you were to ask your your son or daughter, hey, go clean your room, go do what you got to do, and and then come back. Could you imagine with me the audacity, the gall, and the nerve that if I walked in my daughter's room 30 minutes after me telling her, you better pick it up. If I walked in there and there are Barbies everywhere, there are Barbie clothes everywhere, which by the way, why do you even get them undressed? I don't understand it. Why do you, why do you even have the option to take the clothes off? That's weird, okay? You think that's weird? No, that's weird, okay? I digress. But anyway, what if there were Barbies everywhere, clothes everywhere, and I walked up to my five-year-old and I said, hey, Cameron, hey, uh, I'm gonna need you to help me understand why you didn't listen to me before I, uh, before I spank your honey. I need you to help me understand before I ground you for a month. Uh, I need you to help me understand because your mom's about to come in here and it's gonna get real, okay? I need you to help me understand. Could you imagine the gaw if she just said, Daddy, I thought you were just joking. (laughs) Or as she says it, Daddy, I thought you were just choking. (laughs) She's cute. She's cute. Uh, No, no, obviously I wouldn't just be like... (laughs) You're right, I was just joking. You know what, whenever I said it, it was just a suggestion, you know? It was just, I was just messing with you that I didn't really want you to pick up your room. I was just, you can leave it, you can leave it. No! (laughs) No, I'm not gonna just, oh yeah, that's fine, yeah. No, I'm gonna probably whip her. No, I'm kidding, I'm not really gonna, I'm just like, pick this stuff up, pick it up. Can you tell I'm joking now, right? (laughs) It'd be one of those moments 
that, that I can get frustrated at my kid. I really can't. Come on, we all get frustrated at our teenagers and our kids from doing something stupid. I mean, something similar. Um, we can get frustrated in the moment. We can get upset with them in the moment. But how many times do we do the same thing? And when God asks you, hey, Weston, hey, <laughs> what are you doing? And we say, I thought it was just a suggestion. I, I thought you were just joking. Come on, we, we do it too. We look at God like that defensive lineman or that, that I don't, I'm not, that offensive lineman, I'm not holding, I'm not holding. What are you talking about, ref? Why, why are you throwing a flag on me? That defensive back that causes a pass interference. Come on, those of you who watch football, my God. No response at all, nothing. Don't act like you don't know what I'm talking about. All the coaches in here, yup, yup. We even got a ref sitting over here. He's like, I don't know what y'all are talking about. <laughs> Listen, I, I want you to understand this, that when we choose to break the guidelines and break the rules and break the, the things that God has placed in our lives, broken rules lead to broken lives. Broken rules lead to broken lives. What if I let my daughter live like that and do what she wanted to do? If, if I just gave her no parameters, no structure, no guidelines, just off the cuff, do what you want to do, baby. No, that her life would inevitably end up being broken because I chose not to give her structure. But we do it often. We do it all the time. Majority of us in here, we know what to do. We know how to do it. But oftentimes we choose not to. My dad made me memorize this scripture whenever I was younger because I, I grew up in church, y'all. My, my grandfather was a pastor. I was practically born on the pew on the front row. Like, I knew what to do. John three sixteen tattooed on my back at five years old. Like, it was intense, y'all. It was more like a cult, but I'm kidding. That's a joke. That's a joke. But watch what James four seventeen says. Watch this. Therefore, to him who knows to do good, you know the right thing to do. You know what you ought to do, but, but does not do it. So if I don't do the right thing, if I don't do the good thing, if I don't do the righteous thing, if I don't do the God thing, if I choose not to do what is right, then that is what? Sin. Dang, that's tough. Pastor Chris, come back. <laughs> Listen, I, this to me seems all too well in the church because oftentimes we hear a good message but we don't put it into practice because there's a difference. There's a, dif there's a difference between what we do right here and what we do out there. I know what I should do and I know what I ought to do. I know what my kids should do. Oh, but Lord help if I gotta do it. Pastor Wesson, that's tough. I know. It's been convicting me too. I'm not preaching at you. I'm preaching, this is me. I need this. So this is why we seek God. We see God see, strike down Ur and Onan because they weren't willing to be obedient to God. In Genesis chapter 38, verse 11, this is a key verse. This is a pivotal verse. It says this, Then Judah said to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, Remain a widow in your father's house till my, I want you to underline this if you're taking notes, Highlight it, put a star by it. Till my son Shelah is grown. Remember, he's young. He's young. He is traditionally, culturally, he is supposed to be the one that is to marry Tamar next in order to fulfill the birthright. Okay? So go hang out, do what you got to do. <laughs> so that was weird. That's strange. If you think that was strange, wait, what happens next? <laughs> so some time passes. Okay, we're going to fast forward a couple years. From verse 11 to verse 12, literally a, a time lapse happens. And watch, Genesis chapter 38, verse 12 through 14, it says this. Now in the process of time, the daughter of Shua, Judah's wife, dies. She passes away. Okay, and, and he said, and Judah was comforted and went up to his sheep shearers at Timnah. He and his friend, Hurrah, the Adulamite. Verse 13, 
And it was told to Tamar, saying, Look, your father-in-law is going up to Timnah to shear his sheep. Verse 14. So she took off her widow's garments, covered herself with a veil, wrapped herself, sat in an open place, which was on the way to Timnah. For she saw that Shelah was grown, and she was not given to him as a wife. I had to reread this over and over and over again to try to picture what was happening. She went and covered herself and did something because she was upset. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> she did something because she was mad, y'all. All my, all my ladies in the room, let me, let me see some hands. Y'all see me? Yeah. Let me come on, wave at me. If you're a lady in the room, say, hey. I want to say, say it with your chest, girl. Say, hey. That's, that's sad when I can do it better than you. Hey. <clears throat> See, y'all know what I'm about to say. A woman scorned? Ooh, Jesus. Judah's in trouble. Because she was promised to his son. And all of a sudden, you've been comforted because you lost your wife. And so you and your son are just beep bopping down the road to Timna. She sees this goes on. She goes, oh, no, he didn't. Oh no, oh no, he didn't. She's sitting there upset because she is promised to be with the son and she's not. She's sitting here scorned, upset. She's a widow. People look down on her and all of a sudden she devises and schemes a plan. Come on, women. Oh, come on, men. You know what she does, right? No, she's not just trying to get back. She's trying to get even, she wants blood. You know what I'm talking about, husbands. I pray for you every day. In fact, this happened the other day. She looked at me with that eye, and I'm like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. What can I do? Can I rub your feet? Can I rub your back? Please don't be mad at me, right? You know it's true, ladies. A woman scorned. Whew, that is not, you are not to be trifled with, okay? So she devises a plan. Could you imagine with me? Could you imagine? My homegirl Tamar goes inside. She goes, I'm going to get you. Turns off the lights. She says, oh, I'm going I'm to get all dolled up. I'm going to get all pretty. I'm going to take my time. He going to know. Ooh, he going to know. Got another thing coming. Think he going to do that to me. Done lost his mind. Shoot. Tell you what. Never again. Flips on the lights. Boom! <laughs> the Bible says she covered herself. She sat in an open place. Judah probably walked up. He said, hey, girl, hey. She said, <laughs> that's what the Tasmanian devil says, I guess. What's funny is I saw that this, guys, this is the only like available thing around Halloween at Walmart. So that's, this is what we're left with. Happy Halloween. <laughs> Yay. It's cute, right? Uh, yeah, so she, she, she sat there and she conceals herself and you can't see me and she devised this plan. She, she has this scheme of attack and, and, and she hopes that, that he's not going to recognize her because She's probably saying in her mind, trick or treat. Hey. I'm kidding. That, that illustration's dumb. I'll take that off. Oh. oh. I'm sorry. This, this probably hits a little bit closer to home. Because some of y'all are like, oh, we don't really do Halloween. But we'll say, let's le bon temps roule. I'm sorry. Were you standing there? That's my bad. That's my bad. You see, it's, it's easy to point the finger because this is demonic. This is pagan worship. Skulls and goblins and ghouls and mummies and all the above and all the nasty stuff. Oh, well, we can't participate in that. But February and March co comes around. Hey. Maybe it should have a nose and come with an outfit. I'm sorry, is that too close? Listen, the problem is 
We do this every year. We hide behind the things that God has never called us to hide behind because he's called you to stand out and be different. And when you dress up and you look like the rest of the world, they can never see who God has really created you to be. We hide behind a mask and we think that we can be covered because no one else will see what we're doing. No one can really truly identify who we are. I know this is heavy. And I may not have the right to speak on it or to speak in your life, but I know God has a purpose and a plan for your life. And as long as we continue to hide behind a mask, he will never truly be able to use us for who he's called us to be. I want you to ask yourself today. I, I love assessments, evaluations. The second point today is we have to ask ourselves, what are our masks and what are our motives? What is, what's the mask that I'm hiding behind? What are my motives? What are my intentions? Listen, two distinct times of year, we, we, we have these obscurities. We have these face coverings and, and we have these things and, and we mask ourselves. And listen, I want you to understand something. Don't get me wrong and don't get it twisted and don't leave here ticked off and upset. Come back next week, Pastor Chris will do a better job. Don't leave upset today. I'm not saying as Christians that we cannot participate in Mardi Gras and, and Halloween. I'm not saying that as Christians we can't do those things, but I am saying when you allow those things to have more control on your life than you do on it, then there may be a problem. When, when you look like everybody else dressing up, when, when we're not looking differently or saying different things around the same time that everybody else is doing and going, listen, I, I have to explain to my five-year-old every single year why we don't do Halloween. Why? why? You want to know why? Well, one, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Not, not saying that people that are going to go trick-or-treating and dress up innocently as a Tasmanian devil, that's not a big deal. I'm not fretting over that. But what I will fret over is when I'm walking down the street with my child and she looks at a house and it's covered in cobwebs, caution tape, mummies on the ground, and you're dressed up as a witch saying, trick or treat. No, we're not coming to your house. I love you, but we're not doing it. Because you're not the one that's got to counsel my child when she wakes up with bad dreams later. I am, because I'm her father. Because I'm the one that's got to raise up a godly woman. Because I'm the one that's got to help her learn and understand why we do what we do. And we can't complain about a holiday and the things that go on where we're not willing to contribute to it. Oh wait, we did. Carnival! We gave you a healthy alternative. Why? Because you don't have to explain anything away that goes on out here. You can come in a healthy, godly environment, and you can still get candy, and you can still leave happy and holy. Amen. Every year, every year, it, it comes around. We walk into Walmart and Lowe's, and everything's orange, black, and purple, and we're like, the atmosphere, it feels different, doesn't it? It changes but guess what? Tomorrow when you go into Walmart, what do you hear? Christmas! Yay! Oh my gosh! All the ladies are ecstatic. My neighbor is looking for more lights. Oh yeah, that'll work, right? We can't get mad about that. You drive around looking. Oh my gosh, look at all the pretty lights. What do you think when you're driving around looking at all the Halloween decorations? Oh my gosh, look at that house. I'll go there. No! <laughs> Not gonna do that. That looks spooky. No. It's a change in atmosphere. Just like when my daughter turns on her iPad to watch YouTube. And all of a sudden, just because it's the month of October, it, it, the song changes. Do, 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 do. Do, do, do. She literally asked me, Daddy, why is that music playing? Baby, I don't know. Because it's October. Everything on my Apple, Disney, come on, all our streaming services, you see it. What are they advertising? Horror movies, villains, all the stuff that 
You're enticed by. Why? Because they're trying to draw you in. It sets the atmosphere. And what I'm here to tell you today, church, is are you going to set the atmosphere for your home? Or are you going to let it set you? You've got to be the one that sets the thermostat for your house, for your kids, that when they look to for some stability and some and structure and foundation, what is going to determine the atmosphere of your house? Is it this? Is it this? Or is it everything else around us? Just because it's October. No, I refuse to let that happen. Now listen, I don't want you to take this and, and get it twisted. Don't take what I'm saying and my, my personal parenting conviction and make it biblical absolute. Well, Pastor Weston said, don't do that. Go study it out for yourself. I'm just convicted by what I read. And I want you to be as well. Genesis chapter 38, verse 15, as we continue reading, it said, when Judah saw her, he thought she was a harlot. Pastor Weston, there's nothing wrong with putting on a mask and going to a masquerade or a ball. There, there's nothing wrong with putting on a mask. No, the, those holidays are not evil in intent, but they're evil in origin. You know where Mardi Gras and Halloween derived from paganistic rituals. He thought she was a harlot. She thought, he thought that she was somebody that she was not supposed to be. Could you imagine if she wouldn't have done this? If he would have saw her just as his daughter-in-law? <gasps> Tamar, oh my gosh, it's you. I'm so sorry, I forgot. Um, here, hey, let's, while we're at it, here, marry my son, Shalal, let's go. This is awesome, yeah, praise God. What a, what a great moment that we have. That's not what happened. She was offended and upset. She masked herself, introduced herself to her father-in-law, and he thought she was a harlot because she covered her face. Because she covered her face. I wonder what people think of us as Christians or people here at New Hope when we choose to cover our face. Can I ask you, why would we conceal what God has called us to uncover? Why would we conceal? Why would we hide what God has called us to shine bright for him? I love this. Come on, a little Sunday school trivia for you. Hide it under a bushel. No, I'm gonna... Hide it under a bushel. No, I'm going to let it. Don't let Satan <laughs> it out. I'm gonna... That was always my favorite part, spreading COVID and everything. We didn't even, we didn't even know what COVID was. We just, <laughs> hey, look, do it in my face. Okay. <laughs> stupid. It's stupid. Germex wasn't even invented then. <laughs> I go wash your hands and your face. Matthew 5. 14 says, you are the light of the world. You? Who's he talking about? Us. Me. You are the light of the world. He's not, he's not saying that, yes, he, he is. Jesus is the light of the world. But he's not saying this in reference to himself. He's saying it in reference to you, the church. You are the light of the world for your workplace, for your friend group, for the people in your family, you are the light for your household. You're the light of the world. A city set on a hill, it cannot be hidden. Oh, come on. Nor do people light a lamp and then put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to the whole house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Because of the light that you're willing to shine, people will know God. Because of the light that you're willing to shine, not hiding, or hiding it under a basket. It's amazing what happens oftentimes. Do you realize like if you were to put a basket over a, over a, a flame, a candle, what would happen to the basket? It's amazing what the flame of God will do when you try to hide. Be sure your sin will find you out. We can't try to cover it up forever. 
God wants you to let your light shine for him. So let's continue reading. Let's continue reading Genesis chapter 38. Let me give you just a snapshot of what happens. Verses 16 through 23, Judah ends up sleeping with his daughter-in-law because he thought she was a harlot, a woman of the streets. They sleep together and Judah is trying to pay her for her services and he ends up leaving his staff, a signet ring and a cord and then he was trying to go and get a goat and pay her also with that but then he couldn't find her and, and she runs off. Fast forward three months later, word gets out that Tamar is pregnant with twins, twins. Judah finds this out, he hears word of this and he's furious, livid. He cannot believe his own ears. My daughter-in-law has been sleeping around? What? He's so mad, he calls her and he says, bring her here because we're gonna burn her alive. This is in verse 25 and 26. Right around this time, they bring her forward and Judah beyond himself, mad, furious. He says, do you have any final words? We're about to burn you to death because of your treachery, because of your cheating, lying, no good. Wait, what, what is that in your hand? Tamar says, you can, that's fine. I deserve death, but I just wanna show you the, the man who's the father of my children, these belong to him. Before Judah and all the other witnesses and the people in the room, I could imagine the whispers, I could imagine the looks, I could imagine the atmosphere change all of a sudden. As Judah goes from furious to guilty, to shame, to regret. She says, this signet ring, this cord, and this staff belong to the person, the man who is the father of these children. Could you imagine the, the face, the look on, on Judah's face? Just, I, he, he, he actually says, forgive this woman because she is more noble than I. And, and out, of, out of his sin, and out of his shame, all of a sudden, he changes his heart. Because of, now, did you, did you see what happened? Did you notice what happened just in a split moment? Be, because it, it was her sin and her shame that caused her guilt. And now all of a sudden, she presents forth the evidence of the relationship. And now all of a sudden that guilt and that shame has been shifted to Judah. I'm so sorry. But I don't understand it because it was, it was, it was her treachery. It was, it was her mask. She's the one that covered up. She's the one that devised this plan. She was the one that schemed. She was the one that did all this. It doesn't make sense. How is Judah now all of a sudden going to take on that sin, take on the guilt, take on the shame, all of a sudden, because she was the one that messed up? Does it sound familiar? How many times do we do that same thing with Jesus? We take on the guilt. We have all the shame. We try to hide behind the mask. We try to do everything and anything possible to get what we want. But then all of a sudden, when we're saying, God, I am sorry, and I need you in my life, all of a sudden, Jesus says, hey, let me take that sin. Let me take that shame. Let me take that guilt. Let me take that regret from you. I will bear the weight I will carry the cross I will do the things that I need to do because you deserve freedom but watch what happens oh, so good y'all I didn't preach this in first service because Judah and I believe in this moment the Bible says that he took on the shame because of her sin he, he felt it all of a sudden. He let her live. And the seed that was planted in her, they let 
be birthed. Watch what happens. This is in verse 27 through 30. And I encourage you, go read this for yourself. This is sick in a cool way, but it's also kind of of weird. Stranger stories. Months later, on down the road, Tamar has the babies. She names them Perez and Zerah. Perez and Zerah. Perez is the firstborn. But watch what happens here. This is very similar to Jacob, Judah, and Joseph's father's story. If if you're familiar with it, Esau was actually the firstborn. And and when he came out, the Bible says that Jacob was actually holding on to the heel of Esau. Jacob meaning deceiver. He would not only, he's on the edge, he's on the heels of his brother. Always a competition. He ends up somehow finagling his way into getting the birthright from Esau. Esau was the rightful heir, but yet Jacob is the one that ends up having it. And so it's Jacob who has these 12 sons who would inevitably become the tribes of Israel. Most notably and most famous, the tribe of Judah. Judah has this incestuous relationship and produces these two sons. Zerah, the Bible says, stuck out his hand from the womb. They tied a red ribbon around it. And then the Bible says in verse 29, he pulled it back in. And watch what happens next. Then it happened as he drew back his hand that his brother came out unexpectedly. Highlight that. Underline it. Unexpectedly. She said, how did you break through, put a star by that, highlight it, circle it. How did you break through? This breach be upon you, therefore your name is called Perez. Even though Zerah was technically the firstborn, Perez said, no, 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 no. You can't be the firstborn because I'm the firstborn. So unexpectedly, this breach happens and he comes out of the womb and they called him Perez. Perez defined means breakthrough so let's make the connection Judah in this form has placed this seed inside of Tamar and brings forth these two children out of this incestuous adulterous relationship any, any person in their right mind would read this story and kind of almost cringe a little bit. It's, it's cringy. But yet, I want you to understand that what Jesus has placed inside of you, the seed, will come out however he needs it to. Let me, let me say that again. You have a calling in your life and whether or not you want to bury it down deep and try not to, not to let it out, God wants to get it out of you any way he absolutely can. I, 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 no matter what, no matter the cost, he wants what he's placed inside of you. Let me help you understand this. Matthew chapter one, verses two through three, I'm sorry, verses one through three says this. Throw it up on the screen. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Oh, we fast forward to the New Testament? Yeah. This is in the genealogy of Jesus. How did Jesus get here? Let's read. The son of David, the son of Abraham. Y'all know, Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. I want to, we're just Sunday school lesson all over again. Son of Abraham. Go to the next slide. Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac, the father of Jacob. We, we just read that. And, and Jacob was the father of Judah and his brothers. Okay, well, we're tracking. We just talked about all that. Next slide says this. And Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah. Wait, what? That's in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Why is that in the genealogy? And Zerah by Tamar and Perez, the father of Hezron and Hezron, the father of Ram and Ram, the father of and the father of and the father of and the father of. And this goes down the line all the way to Jesus. Are you telling me today, Pastor Weston, that this incestuous, disgusting, nasty relationship is in the genealogy of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Yes, I am. And can I tell you that no matter what your past may look like, no matter how 
how disgusting or uncomfortable you may feel through the low times, through the ugly times. God wants to use you despite your past, despite your dysfunction, despite what you may be going through. Number three, and I'm done. There is beauty in the blemish. There's beauty in the blemish. There's salvation in your story. There's purpose through your past. If you will just stay the course, if you will be obedient, if you will take off the mask and follow him and trust him, he wants to use you and he wants to bring the seed that he's planted inside of you out of you. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. So many times we want to throw in the towel when times get tough. So many times we want to throw in the towel and, we, and we'd rather hide behind a mask because it feels comfortable. We'd rather hide behind a mask because it's the only thing that we understand. It's the only thing we've done and we're used to. It's culture, Pastor Weston. I can't do anything else. I can't go anywhere else. I don't know any better. You know better today and you know better now. Now that we know, let's move forward. Let's take off the mask and let's live for him like he's called us to live and like we know we should live. What God places in you, he demands out of you. And it may not look pretty, but God wants to use you despite your shortcomings. Come on, let that be an encouragement today. God wants to use you despite your past. If you were to look up your name in the dictionary, it doesn't have all your past mistakes. Because we serve a God who redeems, restores, and replenishes to give you a clean slate, to give you grace and mercy and freedom, to end the moment in the courtroom where Tamar says, these are your children. Jesus says, hey, I can take it. I'll take it off of you, but you just got to let me. Can I tell you that I'm so thankful that God was willing to call me despite my shortcomings. Come on, if you knew what I was doing at 19 and 20 years old, at 19 and 20, I knew better. I knew better. I grew up in this thing, y'all. I, 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 knew, I knew what I was supposed to do. I just chose not to because what I was doing in the moment and what I, what I did felt comfortable for me. It, it feels comfortable in the moment. Why would I want to change? But I'm so thankful for God's grace and God's mercy. I'm so thankful that God had a different plan than I did. I'm so thankful that God had a different plan than I did. I'm so thankful that God had a different plan than I did. Because if it were up to me, I wouldn't have been married to this lady. If it were up to me, I wouldn't have those three beautiful kids. If it were up to me, but I'm thankful that it's not up to me. And I followed his calling and I followed his grace and I listened to his voice. Yet I listened to his direction. Are you willing? Are you willing to evaluate what are the masks? And what are my motives? And it's because I know that who he's called me to be matters way more than who I once was. God wants to use us. Are we willing to let Jesus be the breakthrough? Are you willing? Every head bowed, every eye closed. God, I pray that you would prick the hearts of each and every single individual. Lord, the families that are represented today in this house. Lord, the futures that are represented in this house right now. Despite the shortcomings, despite the failings, despite the, the, all the drop the ball moments, feel like we, we just fumbled everything and we can't, we can't get right, we can't go the right direction, we can't do the right thing. Feel like for every step forward in one direction, we take three, four steps back. God, I pray right now, everything would change. God, we would take off the mask right now and we would live for you like you've called us to live. We'll go where you called us to go. 
say what you called us to say. Come on, if, if this message was for you today, you feel the conviction on your heart, you know, man, there's some masks that you need to take off. You know that there's some motives you need to assess. There's some people you need to forgive, including yourself. Come on, right where you are. You don't have to raise your hand, stand up. We're not gonna embarrass you. Just right where you are, just open up your hands in your lap. Like you're about to receive a gift. It doesn't have to be noticeable. It can be subtle. But will you pray this prayer with me out loud? Come on, as a church, the entire family, come on, we don't wanna let anybody feel embarrassed. Can we say this out loud as a family? Say, Jesus, I need you in my life. Take my life. Make it yours. I repent of my sin. I let go of my past. Make me new in you. I'm taking off my mask and I'm leaving it on the floor. I will follow you with all that I am and with all that I have. Do something new in me. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, come on, give Jesus some praise. Listen, we're so thrilled about what God just did in your life. Will you stay tuned, watch a short video. Don't gather your things just yet. We have this important video we want you to watch, and then Micah's gonna come up and tell us how we can celebrate God with our giving. Hey, if you just committed your life to Christ for the first time, or you really committed your life to Christ this time, then we would love for you to text us. Text I believe to 84576. We wanna connect with you and celebrate with you, but ultimately we wanna resource you for your next steps in this journey with Christ. We're gonna send you a version devotional that's gonna help you in this journey. We would also invite you to visit our website at unischurch.com, select the Right Now Media tab at the left-hand side of the page to gain access to thousands of videos and devotionals that will also help you on this new journey. If you're watching online and you're checking us out, then we would love for you to visit as well. Fill out a connect card at unischurch.com so we can connect with you and you can connect with us.